I want first off I want to say thank you to everyone all the facilitators and coordinators and people that put this event together um, I've been doing this work for a long time and in, in my own path um, it's been quite a journey and to have a big uh, gathering of professionals, community members, and people that believe in the power of indigenous foods, to have you all in one room is very, very val validating and very powerful. So um, um, I wanna say thank you all. Um, so <clears throat> I, I'm really happy to be here. I, I come from the White Mountain Apache tribe, and here's what my little abstract says. I wanna read it so I can remind myself, right? <laughs> so, um, it says, I'm gonna use my personal journey as a tool to situate indigenous perspectives on self-care, decoloniality, cultural resurgence, and behavioral health. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, hopefully I can help to maybe strengthen or enhance our self-perceptions as practitioners in the work that we do. Um, because uh, there's, there's a lot of heavy work that we're involved in, even if we're just farmers, just cooks, just custodians, whatever level of practition, uh, whatever level of practitioner we are, when we're involved with native foods, we come in contact with so many different realms and themes. And so um, I feel like a big part of what I like to do is be open and transparent about my journey because that's the most powerful tool that I have. And the same is true for you. Um, so, uh, I really would like to help contribute to the, the social effort to destigmatize mental health, to destigmatize concepts and themes like suicidality, addiction, um, even some of the, uh, the shaming nature that contributes to preventable uh, food-related diseases. Um, so, and, and I want to kind of frame that as we kind of think of pathways forward and how um, health disparities have resulted from centuries of colonial violence. So that's kind of hopefully maybe some of the, the themes that I can touch on as I'm talking today. Um, I'm from the White Mountain Apache tribe. My mother's name is Maridi uh, Craig. Uh, her clan is Bitsun from, from the Sibiqiu part of our, our reservation. Um, basically Sibiqiu tr translates into, they paint their moccasins yellow and it's categorized as the butterfly clan. Uh, my, my late father is named Vincent Craig. Um, he was a singer and songwriter. He created the first uh, Navajo superhero named Mutton Man. He was faster than the BIA. He could leap Shimprock in a single bound. And he's, he battled all these social ills in the, early, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, so um, he was kind of, a, kind of a renaissance man on the res there. So I grew up seeing my dad speaking in front of large groups like this. And so in a, in a strong and powerful way, I, I'm very proud to be here because I'm here with my son, Ari Craig, um, who's, who's over here. So we're kind of carrying on that tradition of using our stories to enhance um, our perspectives as people. Because we are up against a social phenomenon that is continually causing perpetual grief in our communities. And that phenomenon is the theme of colonialism um, a lot of the isms in our community are manifestations of colonial violence. And so for me, in, in my journey, I've kind of seen and come to realize how that has, um, how I embody themes of that and how it's produced different uh, physical outcomes, right? And the main thing is that my story involves addiction and recovery. Uh, my journey to sobriety has been an up and down roller coaster ride. And I feel like it's very important to talk about recovery in all of our work because we are all in recovery as well. And recovery just does not, just does not mean talking about drugs and alcohol. We're talking about recovery from, from incarceration, incar recovery from violence, recovery from a recent diagnosis, re recovery from loss. There's multi, um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of different realms of how we are in recovery. And us as health practitioners or people that are in the field of working with native foods, we are right at the very, very close uh, core of recovery from historical trauma. Because we are, we are like looking within ourselves to find, uh, to validate our own experiences as we create new pathways forward. And so I feel like that's how things are connected. So in no matter whatever work that you do, know that your perspective is valid. And in our session this morning, we talked about, we talked about, uh, I offered um, the, my, my group or my class this morning uh, a perspective. I said, I said, look at, look at the work that you do 
through like an anthropological lens. I said, this will help you to situate your own set of ethics you choose to abide by. It'll help you to choose and select the principles you want to operate according to. Because when you look at your work, no matter what it is, you as an indigenous person represent the truth, the survivance against genocide, the survivance against centuries of colonial violence. We represent the truth because we are still here. We are still creative, intelligent, powerful, and humble in the work that we do. So when you can look at it in that way that what you are doing in your community might not have happened ever before. Therefore, it's an anthropological occurrence. And your voice as an indigenous practitioner is valid. It is extremely powerful. It, it has the, the potential to make it into history books, to journals, to um, curriculum, into programming. So um, I want to offer that to you because it's really helped me. Um, my parents, I brought them up because I stand on the shoulders of giants. They were there to um, weather their own um, issues. Um, my father, Vincent Craig, when he passed on, he passed on sober of 24 years. So um, I got sober when I was 32. And this legacy of shortening the time frame down, where we can all look at ourselves as cycle breakers, because each one of the, the, each one of the social ills or health disparities that we address through our work, we are all in recovery once we make those changes. And so um, my path is I've been really fortunate to be able to travel. I took native foods and was able to cook in London and Germany and Japan and Brazil. And all along the way, I always feel like I'm outside of a culture in, in the chef world. I always feel like I, I didn't really necessarily fit. And so as I got deeper and deeper into the work, the, um, it was following the foods that brought me to the doorstep of decolonization. And I say the doorstep of decolonization because that's what it is. It's a threshold. Um, in our previous group this morning, we talked about how decolonization sounds very attractive and it pulls in certain people that, are, that gravitate toward it, but we can stay outside the doorway and contemplate it and do it for, um, do it for show and tell, right? But decolonization is actually a practice. You have to walk through the threshold to really begin to live it out. And sometimes we realize that living it out is harder than just talking about it, right? <laughs> so in my opinion, based on my lived experience with my own sobriety and recovery and all of the different realms that I've been able to traverse through, it seems like um, public health and decolonization have very similar, similar core principles in line with recovery culture and sobriety culture. So I feel like it's, uh, it's a really neat way to um, tell this story and share a part of my life because I've, I've evolved into a clinician. I'm a behavioral health tech in the work that I do and um, I've got certified as an advanced relapse prevention specialist. And being able to weave a, um, an approach to recovery work that involves food has been one of the most amazing time, uh, amazing opportunities for me. The, the work that we do centers around allowing people to connect, um, not just people in, in active addiction, but also people that are suffering from intergenerational grief, right? So many of the principles of recovery and health are the same. And so um, talking about cultural resurgence, making it fun, making it appeal, making it uh, applicable in different scenarios, whenever we're doing that, we're always going back to core principles love, respect, humility, integrity, honesty, compassion, right? Indigeneity, we're always on the path. And that's what we have in common are those core sets of principles. So um, I would like to just say that whatever the work you're doing, it's valid. Sometimes we get so deep in it that we get uh, exhausted and it's emotionally taxing. We feel like the issues are so big and so many, but don't give up the fight because we are setting a foundation for the next 25, you know, the next five, 10, 25, 30 years. In our class today, we talked about the, the, um, the population shift, how by 2030 in the American Southwest, um, minorities are gonna be the majority. And then in 2050, the, the minorities are gonna be the majority across America. And that's gonna call for a change because of demand in the legal system, in the, in, in the institutional education system, in public health, in nutrition, 
So right now is that time to situate your perspective that what you are doing has the potential to last 20 years. Um, because as we all talk and we uh, talk about themes like decolonizing and indigenizing our diets for health, we are actually right in that process of creating the, the foundation for others to stand on. And um, <clears throat> to me in my, in my personal journey, it's been one that's um, been, like I said, up and down and trial and error. And I'm fortunate to be, um, I, I, the way I try to look at it is I'm a dad first. I'm a community member. I'm res that guy from White River who likes to skateboard and listen to hip hop and punk rock music, you know? I, I try not to um, let like my chef coat determine who I am. My chef coat is just one of the haps, hats that I wear. It is not my identity. And without my health and well-being and how I take care of my, my set of ethics and how I operate in the world, this, this goes away. So I um, wanted to be able to say that I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I heard um, Denisa mention that um, I do, when she did run into me last night, I said, wow, all my superheroes are here. You know what I mean? It's, it's really neat to be able to be in the same uh, room and hear you all talk and to inspire others. Um, what uh, <clears throat> my, my, I feel like a lot of the themes that we're, we're up against in, across our communities, we kind of talked about it this morning. And I know in, in my personal journey and trying to use it as a tool and being vulnerable so that I can strengthen my skill set has been very difficult. And one thing along the way, see, like I'm coming from White River, Arizona, we're three and a half hours northeast of Phoenix. And as I was a young cook traveling and cooking and training, um, I used to feel like because I was from the res, there I had X, Y, and Z more, more res cred, right? <laughs> but as I've gotten older and I've gotten deeper into the work and understanding behavioral health themes and concepts of recovery and different understanding and learning at a basic level, um, some of these treatment modalities, I understand now I don't, I've, I've kind of departed from that, that way of thinking. Indigeneity is, I think a lot of times we have a tendency to put it on a scale and say, we, we have it harder on the res than you do in the city, right? We have this because we don't have that. And so I, I wanna encourage and maybe share or plant a seed of a message that that's not true. There is no scale when it comes to res cred, street cred metropolitan cred, right? Urban natives versus res natives. The, 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 the journey of realizing our strength, the journey towards indigeneity or recovery or sobriety or change is hard no matter what for us. We, so like, for example, I live on the White Mountain Apache tribe. I'm lucky enough to have access to our, our sacred mountains. I'm, a, I'm fortunate to have access to hear my Apache language spoken around me. In a metropolitan environment, it might not be that way for indigenous peoples as well. So no matter where we are on this scale, we, when we kind of build and create and establish a set of principles, we will realize that that equalizes us. And if we can recognize this cultural phenomenon of um, colonialism, I was talking in our, our, our session this morning saying, if, if colonization was the act of violence, that was a five, 600 year process and it's ongoing to right now, then the, the impact or the effect or the mani manifestation is colonialism. Look at it like alcoholism. Would it, wouldn't it be amazing if we could somehow get colonialism into the DSM-5? You know what I mean? Like as a disorder, is it progressive? Does it have symptoms? Is it fatal? I say yes, yes, yes. Because we do embody themes of colonial violence. The whole process in understanding what decolonization is, is that we detach from those themes and we find a new journey. So when I say destigmatizing mental health, destigmatizing suicidality, destigmatizing trauma and behavioral health, that is a very important thing because we're not just talking about, um, you know, super extra vulnerable people. We're talking about people that are living with this experience of trauma. We're talking about people that are just like us and this human experience that we're all dealing with that respond to colonialism in a different way. For some people, it's debilitating and we're in prison, we're addicted, we're early death. For some people, it's a stressor. They're living with it on a regular basis. For some people, we're in denial, don't even know it exists, right? 
Um, so there's different layers and levels to how we can decolonize. And I feel like it's really important to understand and develop a set of ethics and practices so we can move forward because and do our best to meet us meet each other where we're at and as as i talk about these themes they're kind of weaving in and out of the clinical the cultural the res and my experience and like that's kind of what i try to do in my 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 work is understanding that our voices as individuals our voices as practitioners as fathers as parents is valid it has the power because we represent the truth. And so I want to encourage you and validate your struggle. Um, there's a favorite saying of mine in recovery circles to trust your struggle. You know what I mean? Uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And you know, so it's, it's um, being able to be comfortable with who we are and laugh a lot, have fun with it. And what I really um, think is I'd like to be able to encourage you to use your story to impact someone else because we never know how and when someone needs to hear what we have to offer. Uh, I mentioned in our class and I'll begin to conclude with this is that our legacy of colonization in North and South America or in the Americas is widespread, right? In South America, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, North America, Canada and Alaska, this colonial this colonization monster is a shapeshifter. So it's up to us to broaden our perspectives and be able to identify how, how we're embodying some of those themes, how we're manifesting that and how it's manifesting in our loved ones because incarceration is a manifestation of colonial violence, right? Um, access to care or no access to care, the rigid structures around funding and resources in, in the, in, um, yeah, that's, um, what's the term? It's like a financial violence, right? So being able to understand this, um, this reality that we've inherited is like a big knot that's all wound up in our hearts collectively. And a lot of times, what happens when you try to untie a, a string that's really, that's wet and it's tied in a knot? It's hard and you don't want to do it and you might just want to put it away, right? Nah, it's all right, I'll cut another piece. But when that's kind of how this, this knot of colonialism or this knot of our, our own personal journey is, but when we take the time to unravel this knot and we realize that we're putting the effort in, we, what we end up with is this long legacy that's a metaphor for strength and power and truth. So you unravel this knot that's within your heart and you end up with this long lifeline, this long unbreakable story of what we were once ashamed of is now a rope to throw to people to help bring them up and to throw up on cliffs to help pull us out of things. So what we used to be ashamed of and run from is now our foundation. So I wanna offer that to you. Uh, look at your own story, your own trauma narrative and your own health narrative as a very, very valid tool and an example of our, our shared resilience. Um, so <clears throat> I'm really looking forward to, to being on the panel this uh, pretty soon here. I'm, I'm kind of bummed out Twyla couldn't make it, but it's understandable. Twyla's a hometown hero of mine from Arizona. Um, but there's so many more um, people here and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing and talking and participating. But on behalf of um, my family in White Mountain Apache land and, and my other, uh, my dad's side of the family up in Dineta in Crown Point, New Mexico, you know, I wanna thank you very, very much for um, entrusting me with you know, the privilege of being able to talk and share and communicate a message. And I wanna really kinda uh, stress to keep it real. You know, don't take it too serious, right? It's serious work, but don't take it too serious because we're gonna tease you, <laughs> right? We're gonna get you, we're gonna see you if you're taking it too serious. Chill out and have fun, but have a, a really um, solid approach to the work because um, what I like also um, say is that us, those of us that work with food and agriculture and farming, a lot of times we'll hear and say that we're close to the problem. We're close to diabetes, obesity, heart disease, incarceration, addiction. We're right close to the problem, so kind of pull back once in a while. Um, that is true, that is true. We should take care of ourselves. We should maintain our, our mental health, um, but because we're also close to the problem with the food work, we're also very close to the solution. So I wanna offer this as a, as a parting seed that um, I feel like we're very lucky to be in the realm of food and nutrition, especially in indigenous foodways. 
because our reality, our paradigm, everything is personified. Everything has a, a, everything has a character. Everything has a lesson to teach. And so many of our food practices, from the weaving, the arts, the crafts, the fishing, the hunting, the stories, they are colored by personification and they are all behavioral. And if you think about prescriptions and modalities, a biggest pathway to change is behavior changes. So when we leverage traditional indigenous ecological knowledge, we can really um, create more pathways forward. And so I wanna um, say that and thank you all and um, thank you for letting me talk. All right, thank you.